Good morning, everybody. Hey. Welcome to Gospel, everybody. Are you guys glad you made it? Come on, why don't you just clap your hands this morning for Jesus, because he's good, and he's worthy. Hey, if you notice when you walked in um, on the chairs, there are some little uh, square cards. We call them invite cards. Can I steal yours, Bree? Oh, here, thank you. Um, these are invite cards. It just has our information on there. I know a lot of people have been asking recently, um, kind of like, how do we invite? Where's the information? What do we do? And if you haven't asked for it, you have it anyway now. So you might as well invite somebody. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, we have these cards for you guys. So you can take them. You can hand them out if you'd like to or whatever it is that you might want to do with them. Coasters, whatever it is. But um, yeah, we're glad. And then you also saw probably some of these stickers on your chair. Feel free to sticker slap them in any place that's legal, okay? Don't go throwing them on signs. Please do not get us in trouble. Um, but yeah, we have some stickers, which I think is super cool. But welcome. Again, I'm going to keep saying welcome, I think, because I'm just super glad that you guys are all here. And um, we're honored that you chose to be here with us on a Sunday. You could literally be anywhere else, quite literally anywhere else in this day and age in 2021. You could have jumped on a plane and been in Italy by like the afternoon. But you chose to be at church. So thank you. Thank you. Give it up for your guys' self for making it to church on Sunday. Um, <laughs> but like I said, my name is Randy. Um, I have the privilege of actually leading this thing with my husband, Billy. He is in California at the moment, which is where we are from. We moved from uh, Los Angeles, California in January of 2021, I think. Yeah, earlier this year, um, I was like really, really pregnant. And um, we decided that God, when we didn't decide, God decided that we were called. <laughs> and um, we picked up our lives and our my very pregnant belly and my daughter's in the front row now. And um, we moved across the country and we just said yes. So I don't know what we're doing, y'all. Let me just be honest with you. I just know God's doing something and I'm responsible for yes and that's it. He's responsible for the rest of it. It's gonna be his hand, it's gonna be his stuff. I just have to say yes and he'll do the rest, amen? Amen. Well, hey, if you have never been to Gospel, this is our Sunday Bible studies, and we are currently in a series on um, what normally you probably have heard it referred to as the prodigal son or the parable of the two sons, and uh, we're just going to continue this week, and I'm super, super glad that you guys are here. It's going to be really good, but first, I want to just honor my husband because I think he's really awesome, and um, I think he's really cute, too. <laughs> Um, no, I'm joking. Don't make me blush. No, but I really am. I am honored that um, uh, I married somebody, but I'm also under the leadership of somebody who believes in women and believes in uh, the prophet like Deborah did, like someone believed in the prophet Deborah in the Old Testament and like someone believed in Mary and like someone believed in Ruth and someone believed in Esther and someone believed in a woman and then the world started to shake, y'all. Let me just remind you that the Lord decided to use a woman to change a nation. So I don't know that I'm Esther, but I do know that since God empowered Esther, he might empower me, yeah? And he might empower each of you. So I'm just really honored that my husband, um, believes in us. So uh, this is a, a this just just to clarify, if you are a woman and, and you have been in a church space and you maybe haven't uh, been encouraged or in, in empowered, you will be here. Um, you have a gift and the Lord has something that he's going to do through you and, and for you. And so, uh, yeah, I'm really, really, really excited. And I will keep saying that because I just can't even grasp what he's doing sometimes. Have you ever been in that season where you're like, what? How are we here? How is this what's happening? Um, so I'm excited. Also, one more thing before we jump in. If you weren't here last week, some of you might or might, or might know, we are in the middle of what we call a launch season. Um, our grand opening is one, two, three. It's January 23rd, so 01-23. And um, what launch season just means is this is building time, which if some of you have been in church, you know building just never stops, amen? We build all the time. But this is the part where we're just gonna try and get off the, the tarmac. <laughs> We're just, let's get off the ground. And so with that, we have um, joined, we have started our teams. We have, we're grabbing volunteers. We're training people. We just did growth track last month, but also we are fundraising. And so I'm just going to break down to you. And I'm also going to tell you a praise report. You guys want to hear a praise report? Yes. Tell me, tell me, tell me. All right. So we are believing for $50,000 in 52 days. Whoa, don't get freaked out. Okay, let's just breathe through this, guys. Let's not get apprehensive, okay? Um, so we're believing for $15,000. 15 
is going to go to our kids experience next generation y'all's kids my kids our friends kids and youth and young adults generations is newborn to fifth grade normally yeah but we're also including sixth seventh eighth ninth tenth eleventh twelfth and we're also including that wonderful college that's probably less than a mile away from us yeah those are going to be included in this amount um the other amount we're raising is another 15 for audio visual lighting. You see this one TV. Um, the, if you ever saw at one point the second one, it was the one that was supposed to be hanging in our house and then it got off the, the wall and we were bringing ours and it kind of broke, but that's fine. It's okay. We sacrifice y'all. It's all good, but we're just going to buy a few more so we don't have to keep taking TVs off the wall mount. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and then um, portable church gear because what we invest is going to have to last. So I'm sowing my seed. I want my seed to last. I don't want to sow and then in next month I got to sow again to buy the same thing that I bought last month because we didn't take care of it this month. So this is going to go to that. We have signage. So if you see those really cool, you are love signs. We will be launching out of the Dunkirk movie plex. And so what we want to do is you have no option but to read the words you are loved when you exit the throughway. So that's going to take that. And then we're also going to commit our tithes of this total amount back to our community. So we believe in the principle of tithing. That's 10%. That's not a number I found. That's not a number I think is good. Sometimes I was stressed and thought it was too much, but God always does more. So since we believe in tithing, we're going to take the same principle and we're going to make sure that we rebuild our community with that tithe. Do you guys love that? Um, but are you ready for the praise report? All right. So when we were living in California, I actually worked um, with a really interesting group of people. Um, they were what we would call famous, yeah? You know, and, you know, all that stuff. And I was working really hard, and I was working probably like 90 hours a week. And I was spending the night, and I was working late, and I was doing this. But I was like, oh, there's going to be an opportunity. There's going to be an opportunity. And God said, no, there's not an opportunity. You're looking for the opportunity that man can give you, and I have something better. So I need you to leave. And I said, oh, I don't know if I can do that, Lord. And um, of course, did anybody ever learn that no just isn't an, an option sometimes for God? Well, I learned that really quick. So I picked up my stuff. And I just said, Lord, if this is you, then open a door. So he opened a door and I started working at this very, what normal people would call mundane job. It was like, I was an executive assistant and I just worked at a design home company and I would do all the random stuff. But I said, God, you're doing something. And one day, the boss that I have, um, or I had at the time, he was really, really uh, busy. He would run and do stuff. And you guys know, anybody else know some businessmen in the room that are really busy all the time? I do. And, uh, and, um, and, I, and he was going on a vacation and he, I heard him on the phone and I overheard him say, I need, a, I need to find a book to read. And if you guys don't know this, my husband has written a few uh, books and released them over the years. And so I said, hey, maybe he wants to read it. I didn't know if he was a believer or not, and I didn't want to be overwhelming. So I just left the book on his desk. I was literally only there for seven days. I was terrified. Um, and he's this big boss, and he's a big guy in L.A. Everybody knows who he is. And I left the book on his desk, and I just said, um, enjoy if you'd like. <laughs> like, ran out of the room. And um, he read it, and his life was changed. And he called Billy, and he started meeting with Billy once a month. And Billy was just like, hey, man, I'm just here for you. All of the other stuff, you got it down. You got the business stuff down. You got the money stuff down. You got the schedules down. But what you don't have down is the pace of your soul. And that seems to be a little bit more important these days than anything else. So met with him, met with him, met with him over and over. And he just believed in us and he believed in what we were doing and, and we believed in him and what God could do in his life. And we were just obedient. Fast forward, I, he, I'm telling him, you know, right when we're about to move, I'm like, hey, it looks like we're moving and we're going to start a church. And he was like, I'm so sad, but I also know this is what you guys are supposed to do. And it was incredible. He sent us off. He like took care of us, paid for my health insurance for you. It was just ridiculous. Took great care of us, right? Um, and when Billy was going back into town, he picked up the phone and called him and he said, hey man, I just miss you. Like, I just want to connect with you when I'm in town. I want to be encouraged. Like, I'd love to encourage you. Like, let's just be together. Sat down, met with him. He asked him, how's it going? Told him all the stuff, right? He told him all about you guys. Truthfully, that's what it was. He said, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and Kelly and, and Colleen and Jeff and, and Jermaine. And he's telling all these stories and my boss stopped him and he said, what do I need to do? Just tell me. 
I, I want I want to do something because I was the one who sat across the table a year from you a year ago and told you you could do this. So I'm not just going to tell you you can do this, but what do I need to do to help make sure that this thing gets off the ground? And so um, it, it's an it's an uh, the company that I worked for was an AV company. It was like they did home theaters and designed all these big you know people's houses. And so he said, I'm going to take this and I want to pay for the whole thing. And and and. This is gonna be matched by the organization. So we're not really getting this, we're getting double this. And you know why? Now, I'm not asking you to clap because that's a number of money. I'm asking you to clap because God is faithful to the obedient, okay? All right, that raised your faith? Yes, okay, now I'm gonna correct you. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. (laughs) Hey, but yeah, I just think those moments are like, Oh, yes, Jesus. Not because someone signed a check. I, please. But because God honors obedience. God honors obedience. And I don't know what you're waiting for to be obedient in your life for. And maybe it's not a $15,000 check, but maybe it's peace on the other side of your obedience or joy or freedom or a life without anxiety. Whatever it is on the other side of your obedience, I think there's something waiting for you. So if that spoke to you, just clap one more time. Hey, all right. Okay, I'll start now, I promise. (laughs) Hey, like I said, we are in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. Hey, if you have not read your Bible all week, this is a good story, and so this will count for that. No, I'm joking. Please read your Bible. Um, (laughs) We're going to start in Luke 15. Uh, Let's see. We are starting Luke 15, verse 11. Luke 15, verse 11. I think it's in the Sky Bible, if I'm right. Am I right? Yes. Yes. This is our Sky Bible, so if you don't have one, you're welcome, friends. (laughs) Um, I'm going to read the whole thing through, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go back and kind of break some of this down so we understand this isn't just some cute little story, right? So let me just give you some context. Jesus was hanging out with the tax collectors who weren't well-liked. I'm not sure that the IRS is is well-liked today, but at the time, this is who he would have been hanging out with, and a bunch of sinners and people that, you know, we would kind of outcast. And the Pharisees were grumbling, saying, what is he doing? Jesus, what are you doing with these people? What in the world is happening? Um, And why do you hang out with sinners? And Jesus replied with three stories. He replied with the parable of the lost sons. He replied with the parable of the lost sheep, about kind of that song that you were just hearing about. You leave the 99, you chase me, that one. So um, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the two sons. There are many parables in the Bible that you will read of. um, And I think the reason that Jesus does that is because if he just told us plain and simple, sometimes humanity is stubborn. Yeah? You ever been stubborn? And so what he does is he said, let me tell you a story and maybe, maybe you will get this. And isn't it funny? Some of us still miss it in some of the most plain stories. I miss it sometimes. And so let's see if we we don't have to miss it today. Amen. I'm going to try and break it down for y'all. So let's jump in. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, Give me my share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I will perish with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants." And he arose and came to his father while he was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you come and breathe through this, that your your word says that you are the word. So father, as we read this, may we experience you, your presence, and let this be a teaching father that is 
deep enough to transform, but simple enough to comprehend that you would move and have your being in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hey, um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about me. Is that cool? Uh, I like to shop like a lot. <laughs> it's actually kind of a problem. Um, I'm just confessing my sins, y'all. Confess and be saved. Let the truth set you free. Um, and I, I had a daughter recently and she's six months and she's wonderful. She's actually a miracle. My husband and I waited six years for God to do something and he did. And now I'd never sleep. But um, uh, I, I love fashion and I, and I really truly am inspired by it. I don't have to buy it. I can just sit and read magazines and I know a lot of people don't read them anymore, but I love them. I think fashion is incredible. Um, but uh, since, since then, I, I recently, when we went to California, we went into this store called Zara and I'm looking around in my section and my husband said, okay, here's your budget. And I was like, I don't like budgets. And he said, here's your budget. And I said, okay. So I'm looking around and I see a lot of good stuff for winter. And um, I pick this, I pick that, I have all these things in my cart and I keep walking and then I make it to the kids section. And I was like, ooh girl, you about to look fly in Fredonia this year. And so I start grabbing stuff and I'm grabbing stuff, right? And I put it in my cart. And then I get to the front and I'm like, oh man, this is definitely over budget. I gotta put some stuff back. So I'm sitting there <laughs> contemplating how good of a mom do I wanna be? <laughs> Do I want to put back my daughter's stuff or do I want to put back my stuff? And so I let the Lord speak to me and I put my, a lot of my stuff back and I said, all right, fine, no big deal. And I bought her stuff and she's actually wearing a cute little jacket today that we got there. And I remember kind of not even thinking twice about it. You know, you ever been there when you finally have kids and you're like, this is way cuter than like anything I could wear, right? She's going to look 10 times cuter, but I seem to have no problem with it. And I think that's kind of what a little bit, maybe not the same context, I understand, but a little bit of how this situation went. Where, yeah, I would benefit from keeping it, and I would be, it'd probably look cute on a Sunday or something, but the need my daughter had for clothes far outweighed how much I liked clothes. Yeah? And I think, what, let's just, that's, that's just a preface for this space, is, is that's kind of how Jesus looks at you. Whatever your need is, is far greater far greater. There's not even a second thought he has to provide you what you need. This is what that happens in this story. When the father comes and, and, and we're starting with this and, he's, and the son comes to him and he says, can I have what's mine, essentially? There wasn't even, do you realize like from text to text, it literally was just like, okay. And so the father divided it and he gave it to him. What? I don't know about you guys, but if, if you know anything, um, about this time, there weren't like bank accounts or like ACHs or like wire transfers or, you know, whatever. Um, I'm just gonna use my sister as an example. Sorry, you ain't got choices. Um, they're blessed, they have a few properties that they've invested in. And it would be an example of this. If my nephew came to his dad and said, dad, I know one day you're probably gonna die, uh, but I don't really care if you're dead yet, I want what's mine. What? I'm sorry. So you're telling me basically what the son is saying is you're already dead to me. You hold no value to me. And what you have to offer is better than you being in my life. I don't know if anybody's done that with Jesus. Where I don't want you, Jesus, but I just want what you got to offer. I don't, I don't want to have to like read this thing and like be nice to people and like forgive the people that don't deserve forgiveness. I just want the blessing that's on the other side of it. So that, that's kind of where we're setting up, guys. Like this isn't just, oh, he wanted property, take yours. He literally ripped his life apart. He couldn't just say, okay, let me draw a line in the vineyard and have that half and I have that half. A third would mean he had to sell everything he owned and rip his life apart so that his son would get what he temporarily thought he wanted would make him feel good. Anybody ever request something from God just because temporarily it might make me feel good? I don't know about you guys, but I have convinced myself sometimes that what I feel is more important than the truth of what I know. What I feel today, I can almost guarantee you, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but six months from now, that same feeling that's in me here will probably not be over there. 
Today, I feel like ignoring my husband. Not really, I'm just example. I, I feel like ignoring him, but what will that do tomorrow? Today, I feel like stomping my feet at God because he didn't open the door I told him to open. But tomorrow, I'll be glad that that door stayed closed because on the other side of it was something that went way down. Yeah? Yes? Yes? So this son is coming to his father and saying, mm, I don't really care about you. I just care what you got to offer. Can I have it? And I'm going to bounce. Okay, so that's where he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to the, son, said to the father, father, give me a share of your property that is coming to me. So let us not get ahead of the promise, okay? Let us just, let us allow the Holy Spirit to catch us up to what is ours. Just so you know, your promise is always waiting for you, okay? It's just a matter of catching up to it. And when we rush, oftentimes our character is not prepared for the promise to sustain it, okay? So it'd be like, oh, chairs. We love chairs here at Gospel, apparently. <laughs> this is your promise, yes? yes. Hopefully it's better than an a oak ch folding chair. Um, and this is me in my whatever your it is, stubbornness, impatience. And every time that I step into obedience and I become patient. I just kind of go like this. But what we often do is this. And we take it and we say, this is ours. Now let me, let me protect this. Let me make sure I keep this. And so what we do is we take this promise out of the hands of God. So now we're responsible for sustaining it. Okay, let me show you what happens when we try to sustain it. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey in a far country and he squandered his property in reckless living. That's what happens when we're responsible for sustaining these things in our lives. It won't last. I'm sorry to break it to you, but it won't. I have learned over and over again, not because I saw, but because I did, but because I was impatient, but because I didn't wait on God, because I thought I knew better and I squandered it. And I squandered it and I squandered it. And you know what I think is so interesting? It says not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he took a journey into a far country. Isn't it funny how sin always displaces us? How it rips you out of your house and it rips the truth, the label that God really put on you, it takes it away. We're not comfortable with sinning in proximity of what God gave us. So what did he do? He ran. Anybody ever run? Really far, really, really far. And he squandered it. And it, and it displaced his life. Some scholars believe that this just wasn't a father and two sons, but a king and a kingdom. So he left the comfort of the kingdom in order to, to speed up his promise, in order to get this third of what was his. May we not grow so impatient with Jesus that we rush to our promise and not have the ability and the character to sustain it. Yes? Yes? So he says, not many days later, he squandered it in reckless living, but it was all that he had. And I know this might sound a little funny, but all you have, don't get hurt now. It's not enough. All that I have, it's not enough. And I think we become confident children of God when it's okay that we are not enough by ourselves. I, I, what I have, what I can offer, it won't cut it. I will squander all of my joy, I'll squander all of my love, I'll squander all of my prized possessions if I am the source in which sustains those things. A translation of that word father quite literally means source. So what he was saying was I no longer would like to be connected to the source. I want what the source has given me thus far, but at this point I would like to take that and become my own source. And I don't know about y'all, but I have tried that. 
I have tried that. I have tried to build a life that, that satisfies me and my feeling today and my desires today, but it just isn't enough. You're in the room because at some point in this life, you realize there's got to be more. This isn't enough. Okay, so what happens next? Uh, reckless living. And when he had spent everything he had, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. I think it's interesting that the severe famine arose in the country after he spent everything. Don't you think that's interesting? That the famine didn't come when he had what he needed, almost as if, I don't know, maybe the famine was sent to teach him that it won't be enough. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. But it was after, so that I just, I just want to, I just wanted to be clear in the, in the sweetest way that your sin and your pain and your trauma and your guilt and your doubt, it will always follow you to wherever you try to relocate and the famine will come because the source that we carry is not enough. Don't want to hurt you. Okay. I don't want to hurt you, and I'm not telling you because you are wrong. I'm telling you because I have learned, and I have seen, and I have been in the place where I ran away, and I thought, okay, if I leave over there, then all my stuff, my doubt, my trauma, my pain, my sin, it'll stay there too. But let me tell you, baby, the famine will come wherever you are. It will find you and make sure that you and I realize we can't sustain it ourselves. You know, in Genesis, you know what God said was good? That there were seed. Yes, that there was fruit and vegetation, but he said it was good that there was seed because there was a sustaining option for fruit in the world again. That was good. We, we need the seed. We need the source. I'm just, just reminding you, we, we need that part. Yes? Let's see what happens next. And he had spent everything he had. A severe famine arose in the country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out, one of the citizens of the country, who sent him, his, his, sent him into the fields to feed the pigs and was longing to be fed by the pods the pigs ate. Like, Let's think about this. Let's really think about this. You're telling me this son had a father that was big enough that needed, that he was going to have an inheritance worth asking for. Like we said, some people believe this is kingdom. So the, the father had a kingdom and he was a king. And now his appetite is eating what the pigs ate. I know some of y'all got farms. I didn't know farms were like a real thing in California. But some of y'all got farms. And pods of a pig are disgusting. They are so nasty. One of our friends, we went to their house and they got a real farm. Like pigs and everything, guys. Like cows and I don't know, maybe I'm just too California. But I was shocked at the smell of the pigs, guys. But isn't it funny how sin changes our appetite? Oh, sorry, don't mean to drop it on you, but that what he was eating before, what he goes home to as a foreshadow, if you know what he goes home to, we'll touch on that with the father next week, but he goes home to someone ready to, to kill the fatted calf. You realize that in that time, the fatted calf was purchased once a year and fed the whole year, and at some point when there was an occasion worth slaying that fatted calf for, then they would eat it. But that's what's waiting on the other side of obedience for him. And what does he think he's worthy of? What is he craving now? Because sin convinced him that the only thing he's worthy of eating is the stuff that the pigs eat. Sin will relabel your life to make you believe that you aren't who God created you to be. And I'm not saying that as a, oh, don't sin, oh, my sin, oh, my. I'm saying this because your life is so much more beautiful, fruitful, joyful, love-filled, transformed when sin has walked out of the room. Okay? 
I'm going to keep teaching, y'all. I'm going to keep teaching and fighting with this cord. Um, but what happens when, he, re- when his, he realized the appetite changed? Let's find out. But when he came to himself, he said, y'all, this pig food is not going to cut it. (laughs) When he came to himself, some translation said, when he realized, when he evaluated, when he reviewed his soul, a translation says. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I will perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, father. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he aroused and came to his father. Isn't it interesting that the same tactic he offered the world in the faraway land to save him is the same tactic he's bringing back to the father? Let me connect the dots. When he left... And he went into the faraway country and he squandered everything he had. What did he do? He said, let me get hired. So then he comes home, or he's, he's contemplating coming home, and what does he say he's going to tell the father? Will you hire me? Why is it that we take the same kind of giving, the same kind of offer that we give the world, and when we come back to Jesus, we say, will you take the same thing? Maybe it'll work this time. Maybe, maybe this time it'll be different. Any, anybody? Where we take the same transactional spirit that got us out there and we bring it back as if that's going to be what saves us this time. When I say transactional, I mean I will work, will you give? So he's saying, I'm going to offer the Father more works in hopes to save me in hopes that he won't even make me a son, but that he would hire me. So he's not coming home even asking to be a son. He's just saying, hire me. I don't even have to live in the house. I don't even have to be under your roof. Don't give me back what's mine. I'm just desperate to be with you again because this didn't cut it. But what does the father say? Do you remember? He doesn't even acknowledge the offer. The, the text literally is, Father, I will come and I will help you and I will be your servant. And the text says, and the father turned to the servant and said, go get the party. He ignored it because Jesus doesn't want your transactional love. He wants your desperate, I love you, I need you, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm willing. He prefers that far over you coming every Sunday in the morning at 9 a.m. and doing work and, and assuming that that means I love you, Jesus. See, when we come and we show up on a Sunday morning, whether that's you or not, or you'd like to join the dream team, whether that's you or not, you coming on a Sunday morning is not what sustains the love of God for you. You could never outserve him. You could never serve and make him fall in love with you. You can't do anything to make him love you more, and you can't do anything to make him love you less, and there's nothing in between except for the love of God that is offered regardless of any transaction you might be able to offer him. God will just turn his back to the offer and say, welcome you in. I think some of us in the room are waiting for God to say, "Mm, you don't belong here. Mm, That's not enough work. Mm, You probably should have served earlier. Oh, you're only going to do one week. Wow, is that enough for me? Oh, you're only going to do this. I don't... (laughs) I think we're waiting for God to do that so we can go, fine, I'm going to go to my faraway country and I'm done with this again. But he's not going to do that. He's going to ignore your offer and he's going to say, come in. Come in. Let's have a party, y'all. I'm just glad you're home because my son that was once dead is now alive. That was enough for him. Okay, let's find out what's happening next. Um, But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, father, I have sinned against you. And before heaven, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You want to know why I think there was compassion? Let's just walk through what's happening. There was sin and then there was sorrow. I feel bad. I've I've sinned against my father. But then there was this thing called contrition. Contrite. Anybody ever heard that word? 
to be in contrition? Yes. We've heard conviction, right? If you haven't heard the word conviction, it's we believe that the Holy Spirit will sometimes, it's not, a, it's not your subconscious, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Bree, you should probably be nicer. Don't say that next time. <laughs> Colton, hey, tell the lady at the store that Jesus loves her. <laughs> you like my Holy Spirit voice? Auntie Paula, lay hands on your daughter because she's a little crazy sometimes. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. That's conviction. That's the voice of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. But contrition is I am so deeply apologetic for my sin that I cannot move forward without action. I have to do something about this sin that I let into my heart. I cannot live another day without action to make right what I have done wrong. That's contrition. Contrition to the Holy Spirit will always bear the fruit of compassion. When we come so ready to adjust, to move, to be obedient, to hear, there will always be compassion waiting every single time. And let me tell you, when you walk in these doors, every time we walk in with contrition and we walk in with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, someone, I promise you, will be in this room waiting with compassion for you. And if they aren't, they aren't from here, okay? <laughs> Just tell you that, they don't belong. No, I'm joking. Um, but contrition always bears fruit with compassion. Let's, let's, let's end this thing and then we'll give you the three steps. Uh, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the robe and put it on him and put the ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. We'll break that down next week. Come back because that's going to be good. Um, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let's celebrate. For this is my son. And he was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I don't know about you, but there are some people in the room... He walked in and you're like, yeah, I know a prodigal son. I definitely have a few in my life. But there's a few of us that might even disagree with how the father reacted. And if, and if you do, is it really in question? Anybody look at that and be like, what in the world? He ripped his life apart, sent his stuff out, and now the son comes crawling back with nothing in his hands and he needs me to take care of him. Some of y'all would be like, you should have left him outside. Teach him a lesson, right? Would many of us even question if you're upset with him? But isn't that great that sometimes your conviction and my conviction will never be enough, but it's the word of the Lord that has the final say. I am so glad that my forgiveness, I'm sorry, is not in your hands because there would be days where you choose to not forgive me and it will be rightfully and fully understandable, but I am so glad, glad that I serve a God that the forgiveness is not in the hands of the people around me, but my forgiveness and my promise for eternity is in heaven with Jesus. Yes? I don't know, that's something to clap about, y'all. So, we kind of understand the story a little bit better. Yes, I hope you do, Lord help me. So you're like, okay, great, either I'm the son, I was a little crazy back in the day, I need some Jesus, or I know a son, or I have a son, or my friend is that son, or my coworker is that son, or I am that son. So what now, right? What now, I'm willing to acknowledge it, I'm willing to address it, what do I do now? I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I hear great messages and then I'm like, what do I? I raised my hands, I cried, but I'm like, what do I do now? I don't know what to do. So what now? What now? My daughter is amening me from the front row. Come on, baby. Let's, let's teach him. What now? Let's just look at what the son did when he realized, okay, I got to do something. The first thing he did was he took an inventory. Feel free to uh, write notes if you'd like. We strongly encourage like Bibles and notes and all that stuff here. You'll see Bree in the front row. She's always an A1 scholar with her little note. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, he took an inventory. It says, but when he came to himself, some translations say, but when he evaluated or when he reviewed within himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? Basically, what he was doing was taking a moment of introspection. I don't know if you guys have heard that word. It's become very common in our house in the last few years. Um, Introspection is saying at any point in time, I am up for review with myself. 
at any point in time, my pastor can be up for review with me. My friend can be up for review with me. My friend can tell me, hey girl, I don't know if that was a good idea. My, my sister can tell me, mm, maybe next time we should do this. I am up for review with humility at all times in hopes to keep me out of this place again because I have been there. I have walked away and I have ran and I have squandered everything. And after you live that kind of life, you say, what do I need to do to avoid this overall again for the rest of my life? I never want to be caught squandering everything again. It takes inventory. Now it's easy to say, oh, we'll take inventory. Like, oh, we should always take inventory. But we always take inventory for the good things. Am I happy? Am I joyful? Am I like, is my self-care love tank filled? No, baby, Let, this is great, yes do that. I'm not discouraging that. You need that. Yes, fuel yourself. Give yourself love, but also be willing to to hear some correction. This is what my pastors used to tell me. If you don't have somebody that can tell you no, slow, and go, you won't make it very far. And that's scary because that means somebody can tell us no. Anybody kind of feel like, nobody should be able to tell me what to do? Yes, please, trust me, you can't carry the weight by yourself. I can't carry the weight by myself. But we ought to always have somebody in our life that can tell us no, go, and slow. Yes? Let's be inventory takers. You know, I don't think that... God ever calls us to something that he has not already done before us. So let me tell you where um, he took some inventory. Anybody ever read Genesis? You know, when, when God, he said, this is a dry land and this is the water and what I'll do is I'll call that land and I'll call this sea and it'll be good. And then he said, there's vegetation and there's fruit and there's seeds to sustain and it was good. And then he said, there is light and there is dark and I'll call that day and I'll call that night and this is good. Um, But you know what he said wasn't good? For man to dwell alone. That wasn't good. There was a consistent inventory that he took, the creator of heaven, the individual that was forming the life that you and I would live was even okay with telling himself something isn't good in this. So if the creator reviews his creation, the creation ought to review. Amen? Oftentimes we try to, um, when we get a little overwhelmed, take inventory for someone else. You ever been there? Where maybe you're in an argument, you're in a disagreement, and you're like, actually, you think that's wrong with me? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with you. Our responsibility is not to take inventory of our neighbor because trust me, there is enough in you and there is enough in me for me to keep myself busy. I I heard somebody say, when I'm done with my list, then I'll get to yours. And if you're ever done with your list, please tell me how you got to the bottom. Please tell me how you worked through all your stuff and now you're good and now you're good to take someone else. Just please tell me. Seriously, if you find out how to get to the bottom of the list, let me know. But the Bible calls us to make ourselves humble. He never calls you to make someone else humble. So we ought to stay in inventory mode, yes? Okay, the next thing that he did was he took an inventory, but he also took a step. See, a lot of us will get stuck at taking inventory, and then we just let shame set in. We say, okay, this was wrong, this was wrong, I should have done that, I shouldn't have done this. And then, and then we're, we just stop there. And then we let shame eat us for the things that we've done wrong, or the things that we have not done well, or the things that we have sinned against. And then we just stay there. And let me just tell you that shame without action will always lead to victimization. Let me say that again. Shame without action will oftentimes lead to victimization. And I don't mean a victim in which you have been wronged. I mean this situation, I did something wrong and I wanna manipulate you to believe that it was done to me. Where now, now I feel bad for myself because I did this unto myself. That's what victimization is, is I hurt you, but you should feel bad for me. So when we let shame sit in and we don't take a step, what we're doing is we're just activating that victimization spirit. 
where now an example it would be as if the fa- the son came to the father and said you gave me my money too early you shouldn't have given it to me you should have said no that's what victimization would have been or you should have fixed the problem you should have came and found me you should have known where i went in this far away land you should have called your friend or sent a telegram you should have fixed the problem and that's what victimization will activate that where we will try to make ourselves believe this wasn't my fault in an attempt to never address the traumas that came with that sin okay everybody good still all right so he took a step oh he took uh he took inventory he took a step but i think it's also interesting that he arose that's what the step was the step wasn't the long journey. Because y'all, he didn't just, like, think about this. He didn't just get on a plane or a train or a car or a carriage. This was, like, a long time ago. This was none of that stuff. So the, the applause didn't, and the, the, the step that I'm talking about is not the journey across the far country. That's, the, that's a whole nother message. It's the fact that he stood up for himself. He stood up against sin. He stood up against his own preference to go back to his promise. I don't know what preferences you have been following. I prefer to have this role. I prefer to be known as this. I prefer to sleep in on a Sunday morning. I prefer to not put myself out there. I don't know what preferences have convinced you that they're more valuable than the promise, but I can guarantee you they are not. Preference will always rip your purpose from your hands because I prefer a lot of things in January this year when it is seven degrees and I have two feet of snow in front of my house I would prefer to be in Redondo Beach okay when it is time to shovel snow after six days of pounds and there's black ice and I slip on the floor for the third time, I would prefer to be in my 11-story apartment in West Hollywood, but my preference will steal my promise and it'll steal my purpose and it'll steal my joy and I might be happy for a day when I avoid the snow, but when I realize that love is not in the room anymore, that joy is not in the room anymore, that family is no longer there, that preference doesn't have value anymore, that preference won't make me happy anymore. I don't know what your preference is. Do you prefer to not be told you're wrong? Do you prefer to be left alone? Do you prefer to avoid correction? Do you prefer to avoid change? Do you prefer to be alone? I promise that that preference will either change tomorrow or it'll leave you really empty. Because I followed a life of preferences for a really long time. And my promise was always there. And every time I said yes to my preference, I actually went this way. And then I said yes to that other preference and I went this way. And then finally I said yes to him and no to my preference. So then I took a step this way. And then I said yes again and again and my yes started getting easier. And then I started to feel that someone was running towards me with compassion. 
and I started to feel the ground shake as his feet ran against the floor to his son. In those days, no, no king or man would have lifted his cloak and ran. But I was saying yes and I kept taking another step and I could feel Jesus running at me with his arms open and what did he do? He turned my promise to me and he said, I have a seat for you. I have a seat for you. Let's not just have a party, but this is yours now. There's somewhere for you. Because I left my preference way over there. And this chair, this promise was finally ready for me and ready to hold me. This chair's not going anywhere. There was a sense, there's a sense of security when you walk in the room and sit in these seats, right? Like you're not expecting to sit down and fall. I mean, geez, I hope you're not. Isn't that how God's love is? That it's waiting for me and it's sturdy. I have another point, but I'm not even gonna go there because there's preference in the room that has to be left here. And that's what we're gonna do. So I don't know what your preference is, I'm not gonna make it anything crazy or try to convince you of anything. You might know what it is, you might not know what it is. You might not know what it is, but know that you want the promise. And so you're willing to say, whatever it is, take it, God. So why don't, why don't you just close your eyes, bow your heads, and think of that preference that has gotten in the way, whatever that is, time, material things, finances, more property, more opportunity, whatever that preference is, bring that thing to the front of your head. And I want you to grab that thing by the horn. And I want you to make a fist in front of you. Just hold that thing as if it's in your hand and grip it, suffocate that thing. God, we lift these preferences to heaven and we exchange them for your promise. Why don't you lift that preference in the air? Hold that fist in the air. We are exchanging the preference with you. We release, go ahead, release it, the preference to you, the preference that has convinced us that we need to take this life to a faraway land, the preference that convinced us that if I come home, I have to work, the preference that stole life from you, we exchange it with the promise of heaven. Now, I'm not going to end this. and say, okay, let's coddle the preference. Let us release the preference, but bear the fruit of contrition. Have a deep, unsettling desire in us that requires transformation. May we not just leave preference and forget to pick up our promise. I'm not asking you to give up something. I'm asking you to exchange it. 
I'm asking you to exchange it. Exchange the trauma. Exchange the pain. Exchange the doubt. Exchange the sin. And open your hands to the endowment and the promise of heaven which is yours. Lord, be with us. Meet with your children in this very moment. Give us laser focus on the things that you are doing. May we not be distracted or convinced that anything outside of your presence will be enough but let us run home to the source. We never end a gathering, a meeting, an opportunity here at Gospel without giving you the freedom and the choice to say, I want that source. I want to lay down this life for that source. Now don't let shame stop you, baby. If that's you, don't let shame stop you. And you're saying, I need this source that you're talking about. Why don't you just look at me? I'm not gonna make you raise your hands. I'm not gonna make you uncomfortable. But if that is you and you are saying this source is something you very well might need, just look up. Because if you can't look up in a room, you will not stand up outside. that's you, just say, dear Jesus. Say it louder like you know he is there. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I have listened to my preference. And I know that I need you now. Come into my heart, Lord. Have your way. May I hear the sound of your voice. May I move at the pace of your promise. I invite you in to be Lord of my life. I confess my sins in this moment, known and unknown and I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week's gonna be good. Hey guys, um, if, you, if you really did pray that prayer and, and you, you are serious, like I was saying, there has to be action, guys. We can't, we don't come here and put these cool signs up and put a little fake plants in the back so that you come in and then you say it was good. We do that so that you know Jesus. <laughs> huh? So that you meet the living God that loves you so much. That's what we do it for. So that was you. We're going to have some people in the back hanging out and you are more than welcome to stop, chat. You need to be prayed for. You want information. You want to join it. Whatever it is, we're here for you and we love you and you are so, 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 so loved. Whatever your week has looked like, I hope you have come in and felt the encouragement and the joy that, Lord, that the Lord has set aside for you. But can we just pray and close? Yes? Why don't you stand with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. I ask that you would bless your people today, Father, that you would send an overflow of your, pre of your presence with them today, God, that they would be in good health and be in good focus, Father, that you would be with their families and them as they come and go in their houses, Father, that they would invite you into your presence. May you give them the determination to chase you and their purpose and their promise far over their preference. 
May we take inventory every day this week, God. May we be open to the people inventory taking in us. God, may we take steps to be with you. Let us not speak with empty words, but of words that we will live and breathe in you. In Jesus' name, and all of God's wonderful, wonderful people say it. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. We love you. Billy and I and Addie are praying for you guys literally all the time. We hope you have an incredible week and we'll see you back next week. Bye guys.